أن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا ما يهدي الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمد عبده ورسوله صلوات الله والسلام عليه تسليما كثيرا أما بعد فإن خير الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدى هدى رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار as it has been announced, I believe, today's discussion, inshallah, is centered around a very important topic in the religion. Every Muslim should concern himself with this topic. And it's not acceptable for someone to leave himself ignorant as it relates to this topic. It's also not acceptable for the Muslim, who is a real Muslim, to look at these affairs like this in a way other than the way that Allah Azza <coughs> wants us to look at these affairs. And the way that the Prophet Sallallahu instructed us to look at these affairs. And the way that the companions Al-Kiram Radiallahu looked at these affairs. And 15 years from now, analyze A'lam, 15, 20 years from now, the Islam of these kids is going to be other than the Islam that was revealed in the Quran and the Sunnah. As each year passes, Islam is being chiseled away, especially in Europe. Some of that is because of what the Muslims do, the way we misunderstand our religion and the way we behave. And some of it is because the enemies of Al-Islam, they want to change the complexion and the reflection of Al-Islam. The Islam that the West wants from us is not the Islam that the Prophet brought, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and the Islam that the Prophet brought, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, for those who don't know, from the Muslims and the non-Muslims, is an Islam that makes the life of the people easy. It's not the Islam of ISIS. It's not the Islam of Boko Haram. That's not what the Prophet brought, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Those are extreme extremes, and then you have people from the Muslims who are not with ISIS, they're not with Boko Haram, but they themselves make Islam difficult on themselves and on other people. And as a result of that, when non-Muslims look at that, they say, hey, this religion is tough. When I embraced Islam in 1986, it was right before the 10th of Muharram, the day that is called Ashura in Al-Islam. When my family saw that I embraced Islam, they were happy for the most part. But as the days went by, they were watching the news, CNN, and they saw footage of some Muslims hitting themselves with swords and with chains and with razors, and blood was all over the place. My mother called me and she said, is this your religion? Is this the religion? You left Christianity, the religion of your forefathers, to come into this religion that's like that? I told her, Ma, listen. The Muslims, many Muslims in the world today, they're not practicing the Islam that Prophet Muhammad brought, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So never look at the Muslims, ma. When you want to know about this religion, what is this religion? Then you have to read the Quran. And you have to look at the Prophet's sunnah, his history, his life, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And if you really want to know, if you really want to know what's the correct way of practicing Islam, and you're going to look at people, then look at the companions of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa radiyallahu anhu ajma'in. So the point is, the point is, this issue about a dajjal this is an issue that people came up with a lot of interpretations and they continue to come up with interpretations that are from what is known in Arabic as khurafat. The dajjal it is not the TV set. The dajjal he is not the New World Order. The Dajjal is none of that stuff. A Dajjal is not the Masons. None of that. Secret societies. The Illuminati. 
So for young brothers especially, the Dajjal is a human being, a real human being who was born to a mother and born to a father. Some of the companions will come to this, inshallah, they thought that the Dajjal was actually living during the time of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in al Medina. In al Medina, some of the scholars of Al Islam had that opinion, and from them, the companions of the Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam or radhiyallahu anhu ajma'in, and we'll come to that. Whenever we hear the word Dajjal, a Dajjal. That word in Arabic, for the most part, has many interpretations, many. But the main meaning of the word Dajjal is someone or something that is being hidden. You're not seeing the reality of the thing. The person is a chronic liar, a pathological liar, a big liar. And the Prophet Wasallam told us, other than the Dajjal that we're going to talk about today, the Dajjal, that we're going to talk about today, the Nabi said in the authentic hadith, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, right before Yom Qiyamah, there will be 30 Dajjalun, 30, 30 human beings who will be Dajjals, and four of them will be women. And another hadith he said, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, it will be close to 30. And then he ended his hadith by saying, and there will be no Nabi after me. And the reason why he said there will be no prophet after me, after mentioning 30 people who will lie, and he called them Dijals, is because a Dijal is going to make some tremendous lies. He's not going to say that he's a Nabi or Rasul. A Dijal is going to claim that he is Allah, Allah. Someone in this masjid right now, someone from you kids, someone is the best student from you kids. Someone has the cleanest room. Someone has the most money to his name. He's saved up, it's his money, someone. Someone in this masjid is the best Muslim from the men and someone is the best Muslim from the ladies. Someone right now in this room, in this room, in this masjid, someone is the most knowledgeable person from amongst us. Someone is like that. In the deen, someone is the most knowledgeable in some secular knowledge. So we want to focus right now on the Muslim kid or the Muslim person here who has the most deen, the best Muslim. Whoever is the best Muslim in this room right now, if the Dajjal came, if the Dajjal came, he will have the ability to make the best Muslim here believe that the Dajjal is Allah. And that's for the best Muslim here with the most knowledge and the most taqwa. So if you leave yourself ignorant and you don't know your religion, like many of my younger relatives, many of the Christians and the Jews who we see, Sikhs, Hindus, but especially the Christians and Jews, they don't know anything about their religion. So you have Muslims who don't know anything about their religion. So if the best Muslim, his Islam is under threat, and he can believe that the Jal is Allah, then what do you think is going to be the condition of the one who doesn't know his religion? He doesn't know his religion. So, the Dajjal, the meaning of it is a pathological liar. In the science of Al-Hadith, in the science of Al-Hadith, the way the Hadith of Prophet Muhammad that came to us, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it is a science that has more precision, it has more diqqa, it has more precision, it has more knowledge than any other science in the world today, any science you can think about. Because, the religion, the Quran, the Sunnah, it came from Allah So it's not something that is easy that people should just push it away like this because of the religion. I'm not a medical doctor. So if something is bothering someone and you came to me and you told me you have a headache, if you told me something was wrong with you, I'm not a medical doctor. So I'm going to be careful about what I say to you. I may say, take an aspirin, take a Panadol or something like that. But if your problem persists, I'm not going to go beyond my limits and start deciding and interpreting what's your problem because I'm not a medical doctor. When it comes to the religion, the Muslim has to be even more like that, especially you young people, you teenage people. It is not acceptable for a teenager, a young person, 
to get on the internet and to correspond with another ignorant young person, 15, 16 years old, and they're corresponding back and forth, and neither one of them knows much about their religion. And then they make big decisions. Decisions like traveling to some place in the world to do something. This is one of the problems with our ummah today. Not just with the youngsters. The Muslims are like that. People will tell you, this is halal, this is haram, and they don't even know their elbow from their ankle bone in the religion. If the noon as sacking fell on his head, he doesn't even know that's noon as sacking. And he's talking about big ahkam in the religion. But when it comes to medicine and when it comes to other ulum, sciences, we respect that. The science of hadith, how do we know the Prophet says something or he didn't say something? Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it is very meticulous. And there were men in the chain of narration, just very quickly, some of those people were liars. Some people lied on the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They would say Prophet Muhammad said this and Prophet Muhammad said that, and they were lying. The great scholars of Islam that we should know about, like Al Imam al Bukhari, like Al Imam Muslim, and Imam Ahmed, these scholars came later on and they looked in the history of these men. And they were able to tell this person is a liar and this person is truthful. This person, he was truthful for the majority of his life, but when he got old, his memory went weak. This individual, he's really good when he talks and he records the hadith in the book. So we know everything we need to know about the people who transmitted these narrations. So sometimes there were some people who made a lot of fabrications and lies on the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So those scholars said, that man is a Dajjal. He's not the Dajjal that we're talking about here today. He's the Dajjal who is a pathological liar. So any kid, any Muslim who lies, he lies, his way is to lie. You are following the way of the Dajjal that we're going to talk about today. And this is one of the reasons why lying is one of the biggest problems in Al-Islam. So we have to avoid being on the way of this monster. And when I'm being monster, I don't mean like a monster, like the boogeyman monster. I mean this terrible individual, a Dajjal. So, a Dajjal means someone who is lying a lot. In this case of what we're dealing with today, we're dealing with a creation that Allah created. A man, as I mentioned. He had a mother and he had a father. He had a mother and he had a father. And in terms of the fitna, like in Iraq, in Syria, when I accepted Islam in 1986, I traveled through the whole Muslim world, all over Africa, all over Asia, I traveled almost everywhere. I never imagined in my wildest dreams that Syria, one of the greatest countries in Islam, historically, I never thought in my wildest dreams that Syria will look the way it looks today. It has been reduced to rubble. That's a fitna. That's a fitna. What's going on in Palestine, the way our Muslim brothers and sisters are being killed. They can't sit in a masjid like this, like us. We're sitting in here, and we're not worried about anything, inshallah. We're not worried. But if you were in Palestine, and you were in your house, at any moment, a bulldozer can come and knock your house down, with you inside of it. The same thing can happen if there was a masjid. That's a fitna trials and tribulations and they are many yesterday or the day before yesterday there was a big hurricane in one of those tropical islands did you guys hear about that did anybody hear about the hurricane yeah. if you're living there that's a fitna that you may die some people you know they die the roofs get blown off of the homes that's a fitna they call it a trial and tribulation the prophet said about the dajjal sallallahu alayhi wa sallam since Allah created Adam and the heavens and the earth, there's no fitna, there's no test, there's no trial, there's no trouble bigger than the trouble of the Dijjah. And because of that, there are a few very important issues why we should study this issue. So whoever chose this topic, it's an important topic. One of the reasons why it's important for us to study this issue is what Al-Mustafa says, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
He said, إِنَّ مِنْ أَشْرَاتِ السَّاعَةِ أَنْ لَا يُذْكَرُ الدَّجَّالِ عَنِ الْمَنَابِقِ One of the signs that Yomu Qiyam is close is that the Muslims won't mention about the Dajjal from the member. They'll forget about it. And this issue shouldn't be forgotten about. There's not a day in your life. How old are you, little man? How old are you? Eight. Eight years old. How old are you? Seventeen. Seventeen. How old are you, Ahi? Thirteen. There's not a day in your life. You're sitting here. There's not a day in your life if you're above the age of ten. There's not a day in your life except that you should remember the Dijjah. So the Imam of this masjid, if you give a khutbah, one khutbah every month about the Dijjah, wallahi, he did a good job. Because one of the signs of Yomul Qiyam, and this is a proof that Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was the truth. How did he know that in our masjid, this masjid right now, and other masajid, that we barely, we, we barely talk about the Dijjah? He knew that because Allah, he didn't know that because he knows the ilm al ghayb he knows the unseen. Well, because he's hazim nazim, he's everywhere, omnipresent. He knew that because Allah told him that, so he told the people, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So that goes to show the importance of the topic, that it is an issue that should be spoken about. And the mother, the father, instead of teaching our children about the boogeyman, as we mentioned earlier, if you do that, the boogeyman will get you don't teach our kids about this khurafat. Allah will protect them from the boogeyman. There's no boogeyman. Allah will protect you from the jinn. Allah will protect you from magic. Allah will protect you from evil eye. Allah will protect you from any and everything. Even the dajjal. Any and everything. But we shouldn't teach our children about this hocus pocus stuff. We should teach them the real reality of things. And this is one of the issues that a competent father sits down and he teaches his sons and his daughters about. A competent father. Because this thing is serious and is dangerous. Another important issue about the Dajjal is, listen to this, Prophet Muhammad, he mentioned, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, ma min nabiyyin illa andara qawmahu min al-masih al-Dajjal. Every prophet that came, every prophet, and the very first prophet, the very first prophet, he was Adam, alayhi Salawatullahi wa salam. Adam, and then after him came Nuh, and then after him came many other prophets. Every prophet, everyone who came, he told his people, he told the kids from his community, he told the women, he told the men, he warned them, a dajjal, a dajjal, a dajjal, a dajjal. So how is it not looked at as being important if every prophet, if every rasul, told his people about him and warned him, his, their people about the Dajjal. Goes to show the serious nature of the issue. Another thing is, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was a really intelligent person. He was Aqil, Hakim. You see these non-Muslims? If the Muslims just behaved the way the Prophet behaved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and our community, if we just show them the reality of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to give them a choice, do they want to be Muslims or not, then we would have done our job. But we behave in a way that makes non-Muslims say, you know, if that religion was true, then why do they behave like that? If that religion of Islam is true, then why are the Muslims like that? The Muslim child, why is he a mashawah? She's a troublemaker in school. He cheats on the exam. He's the one who keeps chewing gum and I have to keep telling him, take the gum out. He's the one who's using bad language. The non-Muslims say, the Muslims, if their religion was so true, then why in their countries are they leaving their countries to come here? And when they come here, they make problems. So the Prophet was Hakim, he was Aqil. Anybody who reads his story is history, a non-Muslim, a non-Muslim will never be able to point out an example where they can say, Prophet Muhammad did the wrong thing here. He did the wrong thing here. Prophet Muhammad, he was oppressive here. They never can do that. No one can say that in this room. No one. We all did things and we all said things that we regret that go against the religion because we don't have the aqal of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We don't have the tawfiq. We were not divinely chosen. He is Mustafa, Mukhtar. 
So the point here is, from his intellect, is that he used to talk about the Dajjal a lot to his companions. They would be sitting down, just like you're sitting, and just like that, he would look over there like this. He would talk to them about the Dajjal, just like that. And they used to listen to him, and they were afraid. While he was talking about the Dajjal, he would look like this, and then all of them would look as well, and they were nervous. When he looked back at them, he said, what's the matter? They said, Ya Rasulullah, you were telling us about the Dajjal, and then you looked over there. We thought he was about to come out, so we were nervous. He said, if a Dajjal comes, and I'm with you, وَأَنَا فِيكُمْ فَأَنَا حَجِيجَكُمْ دُونَهُ If he comes out right now, and you're here, Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, Ukasha, Zayd, Aisha, if you people are here, the Jal comes out, I'm going to protect you against him. I'll be able to deal with him. But if he comes out and I'm not here, then everybody is responsible for himself. And that goes to show you, little guys, especially, it goes to show the position of the companions in this religion. The companions are not like anybody else. Anybody else. And that's why if Anyone wants to be a Muslim, you have to understand. The only Islam that Allah is going to accept from us, Yawm al Qiyam, the only Islam, is the Islam that is similar to what those companions were doing. Every ibadah, every kind of worship that you do, if you can't show that the companions did that, you need to leave it alone. Every celebration, every ihtifar that you do, like today, do you guys know what today is? What celebration today? Anybody know what today is? Mother's Day. Today is Mother's Day. The companions, they didn't celebrate Mother's Day on March, what's today, March what? 15, 16. Because what they did was, they saw every day as being Mother's Day because of what the Prophet used to tell them. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. A man then came, he came to say, Ya Rasulullah, which human being has the most rights over me? He said, your mother. The man said, okay. And then after her, he said, your mother. He said, okay. And then after her twice, he said, your mother. He said, okay. After her three times, he said, then your father. We don't have to wait to March 15, 17, 18 for, for Mother's Day. Every day is Mother's Day. Every day. So if the companions weren't doing that Mother's Day, then don't do it. Everything that a person believes in is his aqidah, what he believes. If the companions didn't believe in it, then you don't believe in it. And you know another thing, guys? The companions were just like us in that. Some of them were older and some of them were younger. Some of them were my color and some of them were your color. They were from all over the place. Some of them were from Ethiopia. Some of them were from Persia. Some of them were from Rome. Some of them were from different Arab tribes. But they all came together and they were brothers. Muslims can't do that today. We hate each other. We hate each other. And we don't even know why that our community is in the situation. We can't smile at each other. We don't love for each other what we love for ourselves. The companions were not like that. So, the fact that those companions were with the Prophet ﷺ, if the Jal came out at that time, they would have been protected. But now if the Jal comes out, everybody's going to be responsible for his own self. So the Prophet used to speak about him a lot, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to the point, as I told you a few minutes ago, every day you should mention the Dajjal. He told the people, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, إِذَا تَشَهَدَ أَحَدُكُمْ فَلْيَسْتَعِذْ بِاللَّهِ مِنْ أَرْبَعِمْ If any of you make salah, اِتَّهِيَاتُ لِلَّهِ وَالصَّلَوَاتُ وَالطَّيِّبَاتِ You know when you're sitting on your knees, before you say, As-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullah, As-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullah, Prophet said, if any one of you, if you make salat, before you finish your prayer, you should seek refuge in Allah, seek Allah's protection from four things. And one of those four things that the Muslim says in every prayer that he does, standing, bowing, and things like that. Every prayer, the Eid prayer, the Juma prayer, the Sunnah prayer, Fajr, Dhur, Mar, Isha, every prayer, he should say in his salat, before, Salaamu Alaikum Wa Rahmatullah, Salaamu Alaikum Wa Rahmatullah, O oh Allah, I seek refuge in you. I seek your protection from the fitna of the Masih of Dajjal every day in his prayer. So there was one of the people 
from the Salaf. The Salaf are our righteous predecessors. The Salaf of Salih. He was from the Tabi'een. And that is a mustalah or a word that we should know. The Tabi'een, the Tabi'oon, the Tabi'oon, they were the students of the companions. One of the great ones, his name was Ta'us. Ta'us ibn Yaman. Ta'us ibn Kaysan al Yamani. Just so that you guys will listen, I'm going to give $20, I mean 20 pounds. At the end of this class, I'm going to ask you guys three questions. Any of you young guys answer my three questions, you get $20. So pay attention. Because I don't want to just be talking to you guys all over the place. $20 for 20 pounds for you. Stronger than the dollar. This man, his name is. Now, if you're going to get my money, everything I'm saying, you're responsible for it. Okay? His name is Ta'us ibn Kaysan al Yamani. He was from Yemen. He used to be a slave before Islam. He wasn't even a Muslim. And then his people fought against the Muslims. The Muslims conquered his people. And then he became a Muslim. Not only did he become a Muslim, but he became from the scholars of Al Islam. Why? How? Because he learned that Quran. He used to be a slave. And then he came into Islam. And he learned the Quran, memorized it, learned the explanation of it, and he became one of the greatest scholars. He used to tell his son, after his son would pray, his young son, he would say, did you seek refuge in Allah from the Dijal in your prayer? His son would say, no, Abi, I didn't. He said, go back and pray again. Go back and pray again. Pray that prayer again. Now, if a person doesn't seek refuge in Allah, from a Dajjal in his prayer, it doesn't mean his prayer is no good. His prayer is accepted. It's the Sunnah to seek refuge in Allah from a Dajjal. But that shows how the father was putting emphasis in the mind and the heart of his son. In the mind of the, it goes to show those fathers from amongst us. How the Sadif, the father back then, he wants to encourage his kid to be a knowledgeable person, to worship Allah with knowledge. Know what you're doing. And he would tell him, redo your prayer again. All of that shows and vindicates the importance of this topic. Now we're going to get into the topic now because, inshallah, there's a lot of information. We'll do as much as possible in what I perceive as being relevant for the mustoa and the level of the people here. Especially looking at you little kids and this $20, 20 pounds that is in front of you. There are many signs of Yom Al-Qiyamah. Some are minor signs and some are major signs. There are many signs that Yom al Qiyam is going to start. Some are minor and some are major. Some of the minor signs, we see them every day, every day. For an example, the very first sign that Yom al Qiyam is close is that Allah sent Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam? That's the first sign of Yom Al-Qiyam. <coughs> he said, "Bu'ithu bayna yadi sa'a." I have been sent close to the hour. As soon as he came out, it was telling all of the human beings, "Yom Al-Qiyam is closer than what you think it is." So he told us about many signs. He said one of the signs of Yom Al-Qiyam is that all of the nations, all of the countries, all of them, they're going to come together against the Muslims and Al-Islam the same way that the diners come together on a plate. So if I were to invite you to my house to eat and had a plate of food and we all sat around that plate and we began to eat, all of us conversion on that food, he said all of the other nations are going to do that against Islam. The companion said when they heard that, Ya Rasulullah, will they do that because we'll have a few numbers? They're going to see that we're a few people and we're weak, so they're going to come and get us? He said, no, you will be a lot of people. But on that day, on that day, Allah will take out of your hearts, out of the hearts of your enemies, the fear of you and throw in your heart the love of the dunya. So now we see this is taking place today where everybody is against Islam. I went to Canada recently. I went to Canada. I went to America recently. And there's legislation going on in America and in Canada trying to stop the Muslims from slaughtering. You know, the food that we eat. I don't mean slaughtering a human being. I mean the food, the food. 
like they ate, they ate the food, the regular food that we eat. There's legislation, you can't do that. There's legislation trying to stop the hijab in all of these countries, meaning laws, just against the Muslims, not against anyone else. Now we have something to do with that, but the point is, Prophet Muhammad told us about that because Yom Al-Qiyamah is close. One of the signs of Yom Al-Qiyamah, the small signs, is that lion, lion will be prevalent. Lion, lion. Now, when we watch the news, I'm gonna tell you guys, when you watch the news, you have to be careful about everything you see and you hear on the internet. I don't know how many of you saw one of the things on WhatsApp that was going around where it had, I mean, so many examples. Point is, the point is, you have to be careful about what you read and what you hear. No Muslim who has aqal is going to believe everything that he reads in the newspaper, everything that he sees on the news. Because we're living in the time that the Prophet called as sinawat khada'at, the years of deceit. These are the years of deceit. The person who's truthful, people won't believe him. The person who's a liar, they'll believe him. The one who is an oppressor, the people will look at the oppressor as if he's the oppressor, like in Palestine. The Palestinian Muslims, they're looked at as being the bad guys. And the ones who are doing bad to them, they're looked at as being the good guys. These are the years that we're living in. So those are the minor signs, minor signs. But there are major signs, and the Dajjal is from that. So when I ask you at the end of the class, explain to me the two types of signs you're going to say. They are the minor signs and the major signs. Give me an example of the minor signs. You're going to give me whatever example you want. We're going to talk about the major signs. There are ten major signs. And the Prophet said when they come, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they're going to fall one after another. Like if you had a necklace with beads. If you had a necklace with beads on it, if you cut it, they'll just fall. One, two, three, they'll just come off real quickly. So when one comes, the next one is going to come soon. And then the third one, and then the fourth one. Until the last one, and then Yom Al-Qiyam is going to start. What are the ten major signs of Yom Al-Qiyam? The ten. One of the companions, Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman, may Allah be pleased with him and his father, he said, we were sitting with the Prophet wasallam, and we were discussing Yom Al-Qiyam amongst ourselves. So it was the practice of the companions to learn their religion. It was the practice of the companions amongst themselves to talk about different aspects of the religion. The Prophet came and he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what are you people talking about? They said, we're talking about Yom Al-Qiyam, Ya Rasulullah. Before I continue, this hadith goes to show Prophet Muhammad didn't have knowledge of the unseen, or he wouldn't have ever asked the question, what are you people talking about? Some people believe that Prophet Muhammad knows everything. And because he knows everything, you can make dua to him. No, he doesn't know the unseen. He only knows what Allah allowed him to know, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They say, we're talking about the Yom Al-Qiyamah. He said, don't worry. Yom Al-Qiyamah won't happen until 10 things take place. And then he mentioned. Number one, he said the Dukhan, some smoke that's going to happen. I can't get into that right now, but that's one, the Dukhan. Number two, he mentioned the Dajjal was the second one that he mentioned. Number three, he said, Adabba, the Dukhan, smoke. Number two, the Dajjal. Number three, the Dabba. The Dabba is a big animal with a lot of hair. You can't tell the front from the back. Which one is the front? Which one is the back? Number three, the sun, the sun. Instead of rising up from the east, it's going to rise up from the west. Number five, Isa ibn Maryam. Isa ibn Maryam is going to come down. Isa ibn Maryam has been with Allah in the sky, over the heavens, in a way that Allah knows. We don't know. You can't be a Muslim if you don't believe this. He's been there over 2,000 years. The Muslim doesn't have any problem with that because... Allah can do whatever he wants to do. He can do whatever he wants to do. 
So let's start them again, okay? The first one, the Dukhan, the smoke. Number two, the Dajjal. Number three, the Dabba, the big animal. Number four, the sun is going to come up. Instead of coming up from the east, it's going to come up from the west. Number five, is Sabalu Maryam. Number six, Ya Juj and Mat Juj. It's another big problem. They call it in English the Gog and the Magog. It's another serious problem. Right now, guys, right now, you know the technology that Allah has given mankind, and I hope that you guys get a good education living in this city. This city is known for this university here. I hope all of you can go to that university, and some of you become astronauts, and some of you become doctors, and some of you become whatever. I don't want to see any of you being guys who work at Burger King or McDonald's flipping burgers. I want you to be an educated guy. Now listen, Allah gave the human being all of this knowledge, but that doesn't mean no matter how much knowledge you get, doesn't mean you have a lot, a lot of knowledge. Allah is the one who has all of the knowledge. Out in space, they have satellites, satellites, rockets. They send out in space satellites that orbit in the stratosphere. Those satellites help the people to determine, by Allah's permission, what the weather is going to look like today. They can tell when there's going to be a drought, by Allah's permission. They can tell many things. Those satellites, they help to guide the airplanes that are flying and landing, taking off and landing. But even with all of that knowledge that they have, whenever a plane goes down, like that plane went down recently from Malaysia, the plane crashed, they still don't know where all of the plane is. Because human beings don't have all of the knowledge. Yet Juj and Mat Juj, right now, right now, Prophet Muhammad said that they are here. They are here on the face of the earth. And there's a big, a big wall that was built by a person of the Quran. His name is Dhul Qarnain. He helped these people to build a big wall to protect the people from Yat Juj and Mat Juj. Prophet Muhammad said every day these people get up, Yat Juj and Mat Juj, they come and they break down this wall. They keep trying to break it down. It opens, it opens, and then when Maghrib comes, they have to go back because they didn't get it done and the wall closed and they say we're going to come back tomorrow. They've been doing that every day, every day. The people never saw Yat Juj and Mat Juj. Those satellites didn't tell them where this big wall is. You know the Great Wall of China? They say it's one of the seven wonders of the world. Great Wall of China. You can see that from outer space. You can't see the wall of Yat Juj and Mat Juj. You can't see Yat Juj and Mat Juj because Allah didn't allow them to see. A person who has eyes, he only can see if Allah allows him to see. And he has eyes. Same thing, those satellites, they're the eyes of the people. You only can see, you only can hear, you only can do if Allah lets you. And that's why one of the things you guys have to learn as Muslims is you have to learn the statement, they call it the hawqala. The hawqala is when you say, la hawla wa la quwwata illa billahi. Nothing can hurt, nothing can help. No power, no might except by Allah. We're going to keep going. What are those signs again? <clears throat> Number one, the Dukhan, smoke. Number two, the Dijab. Number three, the Daba. Number four, the sun will come from the west. Number five, a seven Maryam is going to come down. Number six, yeah, Juj and Mat Juj. Seven, eight, nine, there will be great earthquakes in the east and the west. The earth is going to open up and swallow people. And number 10, number 10 and the final one. Is that there's going to be a big fire that's going to cause the people to go to the Masha for Yom Al-Qiyam. There's going to be a fire. One hadith said it's going to come out of Yemen. And from that fire, it's going to drive the people to Yom al -Qiyam, and that's when they're going to be judged. May Allah make it easy for us on that day. Those are the ten major signs. And from those major signs is a Dajjal. Now, some of the Muslims, unfortunately, when something is difficult for them to understand, they reject it. And that's not the sign of a Muslim. 
The companions, when they used to hear things that were hard for them to understand, they never doubted the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Prophet Muhammad said, one of the signs of Yomul Qiyamah is that a man's shoes, his shoes, his shoes, the laces in his shoes are going to speak to him. The Prophet said, one of the signs of Yomul Qiyamah is that a man's thigh, his leg, his thigh is going to speak to him. You know the thing you ride the horse and you hit the horse with to make him go? I don't want anyone coming saying that Muslims are against, we, we are cruel to animals. But, you know, you make your horse ride, so you hit him with the stick. Prophet Muhammad said, one of the signs of Yom al-Qiyam is that the stick of a man, if he leaves it behind, he goes out, and he comes back, the stick is going to tell him what his family did, what his kids did inside of the house. When the companions heard that, None of them said, oh, come on, Ya Rasulullah, come on, be for real. Really? None of them said that. Because when something came out of his mouth, whether they understood it or not, they accepted it. Back then, back then, some of the Arabs were extremely racist. Extremely racist. I mean, extremely on another level. Extremely, extraordinarily racist. But when Allah said in the Quran, إِنَّ مَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ إِخْوَةً the Muslims, the believers are brothers. When those companions heard that, they just became brothers with each other. And they loved his, the brother more than they loved the people from their ethnic background. That's how the companions were. What's the point? Some Muslims come today and they say, they say, you know, how is it possible that every prophet warned against the Jal and the Prophet وسلم, spoke all of these words against the Dajjal. And Dajjal is one of the big major signs. But it's not mentioned in the Quran, so we don't believe it. Because it's not in the Quran. And because it's not in the Quran in his mind, he doesn't believe in it. <clears throat> don't be like that. Don't be like that, guys. I want to ask you this question. If a fly, a fly, a dhubab, a fly, you know what the fly lands on, right? You guys know what the fly lands on, right? Flies, they land on dirty things, nasty things. Fool that is spoiled, the rat that's dead, the dog that is dead, akramakumullah, the fly will land on it. The cesspool, the sewer, the fly, he loves that kind of place. If a person has a sore, the fly, he doesn't want to go hate him, he wants to land on the sore with the pus. Flies, they land on nasty stuff. Prophet Muhammad said, if a fly, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if a fly goes into your drink, he fell into your drink, you should take your finger and you should push him down and then take him out and throw him away. Does anybody know why? From your young brothers. Does anybody know why? From your young brothers. Does anybody know why? From your young brothers. When I did the money like that, so everybody started moving. Does anybody know why? All right, pay attention. Prophet Muhammad said, because in one wing of the fly, in one wing, there is a disease because he's landing on nasty things. But in the other wing, in the other wing, Allah put the shifa. So it offsets this. When the companions heard that, they said, okay, no problem, that's it. But today, if you tell a person, hey, the fly went in your drink, he said, okay, throw it away, throw my drink away. He said, no, don't throw your drink away, don't waste it. Because this drink, there are Muslims who are poor, they wish they had that drink. Drink it, just push the fly in and take it. He says, Billah, that's nasty, that's dirty. If you say, yeah, it would be dirty, but the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, to do that. And that hadith is inside Bukhari, a Muslim. The person says, I don't care where it is, I'm not going to drink the drink that a fly went into. This is not acceptable for the Muslim. That's what it is to be a Muslim. That if you're a Muslim, when you find that hadith and the ayah, see this, see that, your job, our job is just to hear and we obey. And we do the job. So now, is it okay to reject the Dajjal because it's not mentioned in the Quran? We say no. Because there are many, many issues in our religion that's not mentioned in the Quran. They're mentioned in the Sunnah. But in actuality, Ikhwani, the Dajjal is mentioned in the Quran, but in an indirect way. 
He's not mentioned by his name at Dijal, like Yajuj and Majuj is mentioned. A Sabu Maryam is mentioned. And Dukhan is mentioned. But the Dijal is mentioned, Ghayr Mubashir, not directly. The ayat is ayat number 158 in Surat Al An'am. 158. Surat Al An'am. The Surah of the Cattle. Al An'am. Not Surah Al Baqarah. Surah Al An'am. It's about Surah number 8. The 8th chapter, something like that. 7th, 8th chapter. <coughs> Allah Azza mentioned, Yawma Yati, Badu Ayati Rabbika. La yanfa'u nafsin mal, la yanfa'u nafsin imanuha, ma lam takun aminat min qabr. On that day, some of the ayat of your Lord are going to come. And when they come, when they come, a person who didn't believe at that time, his belief won't help him. Whenever the sun comes up from the west, no one can be a Muslim. That's it. It's too late. So this ayah, the scholar of Islam said, this is one of a few ayahs where the Dajjal was mentioned in an indirect way. Now we have to speed it up, guys. I want to give you some characteristics and things we need to know about the Dajjal. The Jali has many characteristics. First one that I mentioned to you is, he's a human being. He had a mother and a father. Another characteristic is, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, la yuladu lahu. He said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, a Dajjal won't have any children. You have to remember that, especially the older people, as it relates to Ibn Siyad. A Dajjal won't have any children. He's going to be childrenless. One of the big, big, big characteristics that Prophet Muhammad paid a lot of attention to, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, is that a Dajjal is A'war. He is A'war. I want to ask you young brothers to sit up, sit up nicely, because when we come to the masjid, we have to sit in a nice way, out of respect for each other, out of respect for the masjid, out of respect for the Quran and what we're talking about. The Prophet said that a Dajjal وسلم, was A'war. A'war means a person who has one eye. One of his eyes is protruding, it's out like a grape and it's hanging. And the other eye is normal, but one eye is out, it's hanging out. When you see it, it's frightening. So when he comes, he's going to say to the people, I'm Allah, I'm your Lord. People who don't know their religion are going to believe him. You know why? They're going to believe him because a Dajjal has something that is known as al khawariq al khawariq are the things that a person can do that are miraculous. They're not miracles. Pay attention. This is one of the questions I'm going to give you. What is the difference between a mu'jiza? A mu'jiza is a miracle. For an example, a mu'jiza. Isa ibn Maryam. There was a man who was blind, he touched him and he could see. There was a man who was dead. A seven Maryam touched him and he came alive by Allah's commission. Surah Al-Baqarah, Surah Al-Baqarah, the second surah of the Quran. The reason why it's called Surah Al-Baqarah, someone killed a man from Bani Israel. They went to Musa and said, hey, someone killed that man. Can you tell us what's going on? He said, Allah told you, slaughter a baqarah, slaughter a cow. When they finally slaughtered the cow, he took a piece of the cow, he hit the man. The man stood up and said, so-and-so killed me. That's a mu'jiza. Prophet Muhammad had many, many, many miracles. He opened his hand like this, and water came out of his hands. The people used to come and they used to eat with him, and the food that they were eating, they could hear the food saying, subhanallah. Subhanallah. The Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam was sitting there. A camel walked over to him and put his mouth by the Prophet's ear and started moving his lips. Prophet Muhammad said, who owns this camel? A man said, I do. He said, this camel is complaining to me. And the camel told me that you put a lot of work, you put a lot of load on him. You make him work a lot and you don't feed him well. So then he told the people, fear Allah as it relates to these animals. So the man let the camel go. Can any of you guys speak to the camel? You know they had that Dr. Doodaloo stuff. We're not talking about that. We're talking about real life. Prophet Muhammad was able to understand the animal, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Lord Jesus, Sulaiman, Sulaiman. Sulaiman, 
He had the ability to listen to the ants. You know, as we see here, there are ants walking around. We don't see them. Not to mention, you can't hear them, but they're around here somewhere. Suleiman had the ability to listen to the ant talking to the other ants. So the prophets and the messengers, they had mu'jizat, miracles. But other than them, they have khawarib or karamat. At the jail, he has khawarib. What, what does he do? Listen to this, guys. This is one of the dangers about that Dijal. Before Dijal comes out, three years, there's not going to be any rain. And here in the UK, we don't really appreciate this because the climate here. But when you come from the hot climates, like in Arabia and those places, Pakistan and Africa, where we come from, when there's a drought, you know what I'm talking about. For three years, there will be no rain. Three years. People are going to be needing rain. Their animals are going to be dying. Their crops are going to be dying. A Dijal is going to come out at that time. He's going to come, and then he's going to say, Hey, I'm Allah. I'm your Lord. You want me to prove it? He's going to point to the sky, and the rain is going to come down right like that in front of everybody. He's going to say, you, you, you need money, you need money, you need... He's going to point to the ground. The ground is going to open up and treasures, money is going to come out. So many people are going to follow him. And the thing about a Dajjal is, the thing about him is, if you believe in him, he'll give you more. And if you don't believe in him, you're going to have problems in the dunya, meaning those people who believe in him from the farmers and things like that, businessmen, they're going to have horses, camels, goats. If you believe in a Dajjal, your camels, your horse, your goat, all of those, they're going to have a lot of milk and they're going to have a lot of babies. Your plants, your crops will grow a lot. And if you say, no, I don't believe in you, you're a Dajjal, you're a Kedam, you're a liar, then that person who doesn't believe, his animals are going to die, his crops are going to die, his business is going to fail and falter. And this is one of the things about the fitting of a Dajjal. All of the ten signs, nine of them, all of them encourage people to believe in Allah. If the sun is coming up from the east, once everybody's going to want to believe because they're going to notice that something's going on. Everybody, when they see these signs, it encourages you to believe. But the Dajjal is not like that. The Dajjal, and he encourages people to disbelieve in Allah. So one of his characteristics is that his eye is out. He's outward with one eye. So the Prophet used to tell his companions many times, Allah is not outward. Allah doesn't have one eye. So anybody who claims that he is Allah, a Dajjal, anybody, and he has two eyes, and Allah Aqeed, he has one eye, and Allah Aqeed, we know you can't be a Dajjal, you can't be Allah, and you're lying. Another thing about the Dajjal guys, is that Dajjal is going to come from a place called Khorasan. And that place in Khorasan right now is North East Iran. It's over there in the area by Iran and Afghanistan. That's the place where he's going to come out. And when he comes out, he's going to be on the earth for 40 days, 4-0. Now pay attention to this. A Dajjal is going to be out for 40 days. It won't be here for a long time. But how are those 40 days? Prophet Muhammad says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the first day that Dajjal comes will be like a whole year. The second day will be like a month. The third day will be like a week. And then the fourth and subsequent days will be like our days. So he's going to come out for 40 days. The first day will be like a year, the duration of a whole year. The second day will be like a month. The third day will be like a week. And the fourth and subsequent days will be like our days. When the companions heard that, the companions know that Allah is in charge of the night and the day. The day changes into the night and the night into the day and the seasons. Allah does all of that. They knew that. So the first question that they asked when they heard this hadith, they say, Ya Rasulullah, كيف نصلي? How do we pray? 
If the first day is like a year, the second day is like a month, the third day is like a week, how are we going to pray the five prayers if the one day is like a year? He told the people, Do your best to try to figure it out. Do your best. That hadith has a lot of benefit as it relates to people living in Norway, people living in Alaska, where they have six months daytime, six months nighttime. In the winter when we're fasting, it's elongated. But we don't want to talk about that. We want to talk about why would the companions, their first question be, how do we pray? Because the prayer was important to those companions. The prayer was part of being a Muslim. At any given time, guys, at any given time, in any masjid you go to, any, any place you go where they're Muslims, you will find that there are people who don't pray. If the person is 10 years old or above, he has to pray. Like my little brother right here. What's your name again? Talha. Huh? Talha. Talha. Talha is 8 years old. He doesn't have to pray. He should pray when we pray together, but he doesn't have to pray. But if you're 10 years old and above, you have to pray. Guys like you, guys like you too, you have to pray. And as a parent, as a parent, I have a child who's 13, 14, 15 in school. I have to make it my business that I make sure that these people are giving my child an opportunity to pray. You can't go to school all day and not pray. And not try to do something about it. And this is how the Muslims are today. This is how our situation is. My 15-year-old child, he comes home, he just makes up all of the prayers if he wants to do that. No. You have to pray every day, five times a day, if you're old enough to do that. Especially for you teenagers, 17, 18, and so forth and so on. So the Dijal will be here for 40 days. Another thing about the Dijal, guys, that we have to mention is that the Nar, the fire that Dijal has, it's not really fire, it's a good thing. So if he's threatening to burn you, don't worry about it because the fire, everything is the opposite with him. When he shows people this is for you, the Jannah, that's not a Jannah, it's the opposite, it's a problem, it's fire. Everything he says is the other way around. Now look, some things about the job. The job, he cannot enter into two places in the world, two places. He can't enter into Al Al Mecca and Al Medina. Over Mecca and Al Medina, there are angels guarding those two cities. So they're the best cities on the face of the earth. No matter where you come from, no matter where you come from, the best place on the earth is Mecca, and then Medina, and then Beit al Muptis. Beit al Muptis in Jerusalem. But he can go to Beit al Muptis. He can't go in Mecca or Medina. When he goes to try to get into Al Medina, Medina is going to shake, and he'll be prevented from going in. And then all of the hypocrites, the munafiqun, who are living in Medina, they're going to leave and they're going to follow him. Because those are the type of people who follow the Dijab. Prophet Muhammad said there would be 70,000 Jewish people from a place called Asfahan. They're going to follow him as well. They're going to have hoods on their head. We could barely say things like that today because our religion is being changed. So we have to be careful about the things that our religion is telling us. This is from the religion and this is not from the religion. And if you... The, the way things are going, 15, 20 years from now, inshallah, the Muslim is not going to be able to call a spade a spade. He gonna, he's going to have to be politically correct. Anyway, the Dajjal, he can't go into Medina and Mecca. And that's a proof he's not Allah. Because Allah is with Jal, he is not Ajiz. Many ayahs of the Quran says that Allah does whatever he wants to do. Allah can do whatever he wants to do. If a person can't do something, then that goes to show that he's not Allah. Now I'm going to close this up very quickly now, inshallah. The person who's going to kill the Dajjal is Isa ibn Umari. Isa ibn Umari was going to kill the Dajjal. But look what the Dajjal is going to do. As I told you, many people are going to believe in him. People who just want to eat, people who just want money, people who just want the dunya. They're going to follow him because of the tricks that he plays. Do you guys know those magicians like Dynamo and 
Chris, what's his name? Dynamo, David Blaine, David Copperfield. I'm only mentioning their names because they're well known. That guy Dynamo was in London walking on the Thames River. Did you see that? Uh, the other guy was walking around the side of the wall. You know, the wall outside, a big building. He was walking up the side of the wall. When Muslims see that, they say, SubhanAllah, look at that guy walking over the water. He's not really walking over the water. They're playing some games with your eyes. It's not really true. He's playing some game. And if he is doing that, he's doing it by the help of the jinn. But don't be one of those people who when you see things like that, you say, wow, he's a sheikh because look where he's flying in the air. He's flying around in the air. And then you say, wow, he's a sheikh. One of the great scholars in Islam, his name is Imam al-Shafi'i. Muhammad ibn Idris al-Shafi'i. He told the people, if you see a man flying in the air, and if you see him walking on the water, he said, don't believe that. Don't believe he's from the awliya of Allah. Don't believe it until you take all of his actions and compare them to the Quran and the Sunnah. He's flying in the air, but he's eating with his left hand. He's flying in the air, and the individual doesn't pray. He's flying in the air, he doesn't fast. He's flying in the air, he's stealing people's money. He's not from the only of Allah. It's just a trick, this is the game. Anyway, there's one boy, one boy, who's going to come. He's going to sing in front of all of the people. Because there are going to be a few people who don't believe in Dajjal. Everybody else is going to believe. Dajjal is going to be confronted by this one boy, a young man. And this goes to show our elders. This concept of the youngsters don't have a role to play. That's your culture, man. That's not, that is, that's not our religion. Older people have a bigger responsibility. And part of the responsibility of the elders is to make way and room for the youngsters. That's how the prophet cultivated those companions. Anyway, the young man will come to Dajjal. And he says, you're the Dajjal that the prophet told us about. And you're a liar. And he's warning the people. Don't listen to him. He's a liar. And Dajjal says to the people who are still remaining. They don't believe. They're not sure. He said, okay, you people who don't really believe. If I kill him and bring him back to life, would you believe I'm alive then? Because I showed you all of these other things. I made it rain. I did this. I did that. Now if I kill him and bring him back to life, would you believe him? Because only Allah can do that. They say, yeah, if you do that, we will believe you. He'll cut the boy in half. We're going to cut him in half. And he'll split in half. The boy is going to split. And the Dajjal is going to walk through. And you say, see? And then he'll turn around and bring the boy back to life by Allah's permission. The boy is going to stand up. And he's going to say, I have no doubt now. I'm really sure that you're the Dajjal. Because the prophet told us you were going to do this. And then Dajjal want to get him again, but he can't get him again. He can't get him again. Now again, some Muslims, if they hear that hadith, they say, hey, that hadith, you know, it's like those stories, Goldilocks and the Seven Wolves. It's like um, Humpty Dumpty. It's like those kind of stories. No, that's not a story. That's what the prophet said, and you have to believe in that. But even more important than that, guys, listen to this. When the boy is put back together and he comes to life by Allah's permission, he said to the Dajjal, now I have no doubt you are the Dajjal because the prophet told us about this, you were going to do this. That goes to show the importance of the Sunnah. He didn't say, I have no doubt you're the Dajjal, Allah mentioned this in the Quran. It goes to show the virtues of being from Ahl Sunnah and being proud to be a person from the people of the Sunnah. But being from the Sunnah, especially you guys who are 16, 17, you're growing up, don't let your Islam be an Islam of khurafat and innovation. An Islam that when you look at it, when you smell it, when you taste it, you say, what are you doing? Those companions didn't do all of this stuff. So it goes to show the importance of the Sunnah. <laughs> Last thing that we want to mention, inshallah, is about a man or young boy during the time of Prophet Muhammad his name was Ibn Siyad. 
He was telling people a lot of things about the unseen. And the people thought he was the Dajjal. He was playing outside with some kids. And the Nabi hid behind a tree. And he was watching him to try to find out what's his reality. Is he really Dajjal? Is he a magician? What is his situation? So when the Prophet was hiding behind the tree looking at him, playing with the kids in the street, the boy's mother was in the house and she saw Prophet Muhammad behind the tree. And Prophet Muhammad didn't see her. So the mother said, hey, Ibn Siyad, hey, my boy, Muhammad is looking at you. And then the Prophet came out. He said, if she wouldn't have told you, I would have found out what your reality is. Do the jinn come to you or what? So the Prophet said, last night, last night, he said to the boy, something came to me. A surah came to me. And the surah is called surah ad dukhan ad dukhan He said, you tell me what's the name of the surah. The boy got close to the, instead of saying dukhan, he said ad dukh which is close. He said, ad dukh He said, you can't. The Prophet said, you can't go beyond your ability. But he got close. When he got close, Umar knew the surah that had been revealed. Umar said, Ya Rasulullah, let me kill him because he's the Dajjal. The Prophet said, no, Umar. If he is the Dajjal, you'll never be able to kill him because only one person can kill the Dajjal. And that is Isa ibn Mari. So some of the scholars, even from the tag, from the companions, they thought this boy was the Dajjal. During their lifetime, after the death of the Prophet Sallallahu those companions used to say, well, why he's the Dajjal? Because of many things that happened. We don't have time to get into all of that. But it doesn't appear that he is the Dajjal. He was the Dajjal. He was one of the Dajjal. He was a liar, but he wasn't the Dajjal. And from the proofs of that is, he lived in a Medina. The Dajjal can't go inside a Medina. The proof of that is, Ibn Sayyad, he had a child. He had a son. Son's name was Abdullah. And he was one of the narrators of the Qutb al Sitta. And he's fiqh in his narration. His father's a problem, but the son is a good narrator. And the Prophet said that a Dajjal won't be able to have any children. Also, Ibn Siyad, he made Hajj, he made Umrah. He made Hajj, he made Umrah. But he was like a Sahib, like a Kahin. He was like a Soothsayer. He was a problem, but he was not the Dajjal. If you want to be protected from the Dajjal, then memorize the first 10 ayats of Surah Al-Kaf. And another hadith said, memorize also the last 10 ayat of Surah Al-Kaf. Both of those hadith are authentic, inshallah. If you want to be safe from Dajjal, this is important. Prophet Muhammad said, if you hear that Dajjal came out, go the other way. Go the other way. Don't go to him trying to figure out, I want to hear, I want to see. Because a person will think he's on the religion, but when you go and you listen to him, he'll be able to trick you, and then you wind up following him. And that's a principle in our religion. Don't sit and take knowledge from every or anybody. Don't take knowledge from people who curse their companions. Don't take knowledge from people who apologize and they want to make Islam fit the way it's acceptable to whoever. Don't take Islam from people who teach innovation and shit. Don't take Islam from people who, they don't know what they're talking about. Take your religion from people who, they're calling to the right thing, and what they're calling to can be proven that the companions are upon that particular thing. So we're going to stop here.